Okay, again, it's good to have everybody back in. And again, I always like to explain that because after every half hour, we take a coffee break and you'll notice that the coffee cups are on the tables. And uh, so for those of you joining us on television, just remember that if you come to be part of our taping some Wednesday afternoon, this is the way we operate. We tape a half an hour and have a coffee break, tape another half hour until we get the four programs completed. So we're informal. Uh, I, from day one, I told people I would not come and do this in a tie and a suit, and uh, I think now my short sleeve shirt has become my trademark. But uh, whatever, we're just glad for all of these that have come in for today, and for those of you joining us on television, again, we appreciate so much hearing from you. My, I had three phone calls in a row the other morning that uh, were enough to just put me on the ceiling. It was just so thrilling to hear, and I guess the common remark we hear the most is, for the first time in my life, I enjoy my Bible. And uh, after all, that's all we're trying to do is try to open this thing up so that anyone can read it and study it and understand what they read. Again, we uh, have to thank you for your letters, your prayers, your phone calls of encouragement. And uh, naturally, we have to thank you for your financial help. We can't do it without that. Okay, now, for those of you who may we like to pick up on some of our previous teachings. Everything is available on the video, audio tape, or the printed page. So if you're interested in any of those, you just give us a call or drop us a note, and we'll get the information in the mail to you. All right, now we got a lot of material to cover this afternoon, so we're going to get right back where we left off in our last program, which will be in 2 Thessalonians again, chapter 2, and now in verse 9. Now, you remember in our last programs, we were talking about the leaving of the Holy Spirit so far as the indwelling of the believer is concerned, but how that he would certainly be present on the earth during the tribulation, which, of course, he has to be in order to, even as now, open the hearts of those who will be saved. And there will be multitudes saved during the tribulation, but we're going to see probably in this half hour, or at least the next one, there are multitudes of people who think they can have a second chance, but they will not. But nevertheless, there are still multitudes, according to Revelation, that will find salvation, even in spite of the horrors of what's going on around them. All right, now then in verse 9, Paul continues on this same agreement with the prophetic program when he says that even him, this man that we have been talking about in our last few programs, even him, the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan. See, this whole scenario now is, is driven by the satanic power, the God of this world. Now, when I use the term the God of this world, I'm sure a lot of people may raise their eyebrows and think, well, where am I pulling this from anyway. So maybe we better qualify that first. Come back with me to 2 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and drop in at verse 3 because hopefully I, I use terminology that is scriptural. And uh, when I go outside the scripture, I try to be careful to delineate it as such, that this is my own idea, this is my own projection. But otherwise, I, I try to stay explicitly with the language of this book. And the book calls Satan the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 3. All got it? Where Paul writes, but... If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom, that is, in the lost people of this world, in whom the God of this world. See that? In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. All right, now that's just to show you then that the terminology is scriptural. Satan is the God of this world today. Has been ever since Adam 
dropped the ball. And Adam dropped the ball when he disobeyed and ate of the forbidden tree. Now, I'd like to point out, you see, that wasn't such an act of wickedness, per se. He didn't commit some horrible, immoral sin. But the tragedy of it was, it was a direct disobedience to the direct will of God. And consequently, Adam fell. Well, the minute Adam fell, <coughs> he lost that dominion that God had given him when he first created him, and Satan picked it up. And so when Satan picked it up, he became then the God of this world all the way down through human history. Now then, back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and again into verse 9. So this man, born of a woman, ordinary human being from all appearances, but once the midpoint of the tribulation is reached, he will become indwelt by this God of this world, by Satan and all of his power, even as Judas was back at the first advent. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. So this man's coming is after the working of Satan, and Satan is going to perform power and signs and what? Wonders. Now, those who know your Bible, what did Jesus do? Signs and miracles and wonders. Is that right? right? Absolutely. All right, so what do we got? We have the master counterfeiter, and he is. Satan has been the counterfeiter from day one, and many times he is so close to the original that unless you have a real insight, you can't tell the difference. And that's, of course, why the world has been so deceived down through the ages, because of this man's ability to counterfeit the truth. And we're seeing it all around us today. All right, now when he gets in full force then, and he indwells the man Antichrist, he, like Christ, is going to perform miracles and signs and wonders. All right, now let's go back to the first time we have the instance of the powers of Satan counterfeiting and copying what the men of God were doing. Back to Exodus. Back to Exodus. Man, I thought I could turn right to it. I'm not going to be able to. Give me a second. I have to give me a couple seconds here. Okay. Uh, back in chapter, chapter 7. I was thinking it was 13. That's why I had to look hard and find it. In Exodus chapter 7, starting at verse 10. Now, remember earlier in the book of Exodus, God has proven to Moses that he was God's instrument to bring Israel out of Egypt. And in order to prove to Moses that he was the real God of Abraham, he performed a couple sign miracles with Moses. The first one was, he said, throw your rod on the ground, and it became a serpent. The second one was, put your hand into your breast, and it became leprous put it back in, and it became completely whole. All right, now then, Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, and again to convince Pharaoh that the God of Abraham, the supernatural working God, is the one who is sending them to get Israel out of Egypt. They, too, are going to use the sign gifts. All right, Exodus chapter 7 Dropping in at verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord commanded. And Aaron, that is, as a result of what the Lord had told him to do, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent instantly. 
that shepherd's rod was suddenly a writhing serpent. Verse 11, Pharaoh, of course, knowing the powers of his magician, called his sorcerers in. And so Pharaoh called the wise men and the sorcerers, and now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner. In other words, they drew on supernatural power. Not God's power, Satan's. See? And this is why the Bible condemns sorcery and enchantments and divination, fortune-telling, from day one. And that has never been rescinded. And why? Because all those disciplines draw their power from Satan. See, every one of them. Now, I don't know what all is going out over television because Iris and I never turn it on. I haven't had television on I don't know how long. But uh, from the questions that are coming in my mail, I'm beginning to wonder what in the world are people saying? We had two or three questions in the last week. Can I really make contact with my loved ones who have died? Because somebody said we could. Now, I don't know who it was. It doesn't matter. But now listen, whenever there comes any kind of teaching like that, that is not from God, that is satanic. See? All right, now look what it says. And so they did like manner. Now verse 12. For these magicians of Egypt cast down every man his rod, and they, the magicians' rods, became serpents just exactly like Aaron's rod did with the power of God, these magicians of Egypt do the same thing with their rod, but with the power of Satan. See what a counterfeiter he is? And I even tell people today, just because something is a miracle, don't take it as from God. The little letter of John says, you test the spirits, whether it's the true one or not. And the only way we can test them is line it up with the book. Is everything in accord with the scripture? Otherwise, it's nothing more than the power of the magicians in Egypt, which is Satan. And Satan is alive and well today. Don't you forget it. All right. And so these magicians of Egypt cast down their individual rods, however many there were. The only comfort we can take in this is what? The serpent that came from Aaron's rod went around and gobbled up all the others, which shows, of course, the superiority of God's power. Now, of course, you can take it even a little further. If the serpent is a picture of death, then the serpent of Aaron would be a picture of Christ's resurrection, where, of course, he conquered death and it is no longer our enemy. But whatever, the point I always like to make is that when it came to performing signs and miracles and wonders, the magicians of Egypt could do what Aaron and Moses did, which is simply to teach us that the powers of Satan are so close to the true power that, of course, is exercised by the Creator Himself. All right, let's come back to chapter 2 of Thessalonians for just a moment because I don't want to lose where we're jumping off from. Even though I use a lot of references, I, I want to always remember that we're starting here in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. All right, so this man, this master counterfeiter, and of course that's why he's depicted in the book of Revelation in chapter 6 as riding on a white horse. Well, I think we pointed this out in a previous program. Why does Satan seemingly come riding on a white horse? because the true Christ will, see? And so he's a counterfeit in everything he does. <clears throat> All right, reading on in verse 9 again, and so he comes with power and signs and lying wonders. All right, now we looked at it briefly in one of our previous programs, but let's go back and look at it again in Revelation. In Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 13 again. Now in verse 11. 
Now, of course, you'll all realize, <clears throat> if you've heard me teach at all, that there are two powerful, satanically <clears throat> empowered men during this final seven years. The one, of course, is the political, the economic leader, the Antichrist. But he's going to have a sidekick, a cohort, that is going to have much the same kind of power we call the false prophet. He will be the religious leader of this final seven years. And always remember, down through history, even the pagan empires of Greece and Rome, what was the backbone of their controlling the masses? Religion. Religion. Religion controls the masses. See, the, the communists were right when they said that religion is the opiate of the people. I'll never argue that statement because they weren't talking about true Christianity. The Christianity that I teach is not an opiate. It's not something that just puts people half asleep and they don't know what they're doing. But religion does. Religion puts people under a, a, a drug-like mentality and, and they function only as their leaders tell them to function. All right, now that's exactly what this religious leader of the tribulation era will do. He will be the front man for the Antichrist. All right, now here he comes. Verse 11 of Revelation 13, And I beheld another beast, another individual, not one and the same, he's a different one. And I beheld another beast, or another man, but he's going to be a leader, so that's why the term is beast. And he comes up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, which I think indicates his religious personality. He's probably going to come with the cloak of the church or something like that, or some religious system. And consequently, he's referred to as less aggressive in his actions than the Antichrist, who is depicted as a carnivorous beast. But whatever. <clears throat> he comes like a lamb, but he speaks like a what? A dragon. See? He's going to have the force and the power of Satan behind everything he says. Verse 12. He exercises all the power of the first beast or the first individual before him. See? And remember, this is all coming from Satan. And so he exercises all the power of the first person who came before him and causes the earth and them who dwell therein to worship the first beast. Now, see, this is why we always teach these individuals as counterfeits of the Trinity. Satan as a counterfeit of God the Father. The Antichrist as a counterfeit of God the Son. And this false prophet or this religious leader a counterfeit of God the Holy Spirit. Because after all, in our spiritual economy today, what is the rightful role of the Holy Spirit? To point people to Christ. He is not to be elevated in a position of his own. He is constantly to be pointing us to the crucified, resurrected Christ. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. And to convict us of sin, to lead us and direct us, but never to be the object of our worship. All right, and so we got the same scenario. This false prophet, this religious leader, will not draw the world to himself, but he's going to point the world to his boss, the Antichrist. That's what it says. And so he causes, by virtue of his satanic power, he's going to cause the earth and them who dwell therein to worship the first beast or the Antichrist. See how plain that is? The world is just literally going to fall at the feet of this man Antichrist, but this religious leader is going to be promoting it. All right, now let's go on to the next verse. This is the one I wanted. When it says that they're going to perform signs and wonders and miracles. Now look what the scripture says. This religious leader as the front man for the Antichrist, who has the same power as the Antichrist has, remember that's what it says, so I can use this verse to point out the power that Satan will give this man Antichrist. All right, so this religious leader will do great wonders, 
so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, if you know your Bible, when did that happen before? Well, Elijah. As Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal up there on Mount Carmel, you remember that? And he had the prophets of Baal cry out to their gods, you know, do this and do that. And then Elijah even taunted them. And he said, well, yell a little louder. They must be sleeping. But they couldn't get anything to happen. And then Elijah prayed to the God of heaven. And what happened? My, the fire came down and licked up the water out of the trenches, consumed the sacrifice. This is a copy of that. The counterfeiter is doing a repeat of the power of God. See that? Now that's why it's going to be so hard for men in this day and time to discern, is this the true God? And that's what they're going to think. They're going to think this is the power of God. But we know, as we look ahead, even though we're not going to be here, we know from Scripture that it's not the power of God. It's a counterfeit. It's the power of Satan. All right, read on. And so fire comes down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now verse 14. And what's the second word? Deceiveth. See? The whole modus operandi of Satan from day one has been to deceive. And I'm hammering it home today more than I ever did before. Because we're being inundated today with a mass of deception. Now, keep your hand in Revelation. I'm not through here. Come all the way back with me to Matthew again, to chapter 24. A tribulation chapter, if there ever was one, from start to finish, Matthew 24 is tribulation ground. And you start right back there at verse 3 of Matthew 24. <coughs> Matthew 23, I mean Matthew 24, verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. All got it? As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, that is, the Lord Jesus, now in his earthly ministry, the disciples came unto him privately, in other words, without benefit of all the crowds and the crush of people. It was just Jesus and the twelve. And they said unto him, Tell us, when shall these things be? Of course, he was speaking of the destruction of the temple and so forth. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world or the end of the age? Now look at verse 4. My, there was a period of time about a year ago, I just hammered this home in my Oklahoma classes almost every night of the week. Look what Jesus said is a sign of the end. And he said unto them, Take heed that no man, what, deceive you. Now what does that tell you? Right up front, there's going to be mass deception. That's a sign of the end time. And you're going to have to be as wise as serpents, or you're going to be taken in by it. Okay, now let's come back to Revelation in a few little bit we have left. Revelation 13 again. Verse 14, and so this false prophet, the cohort of the Antichrist himself, both tools of Satan, both with the world literally falling at their feet, and so they deceive them that dwell on the earth by the miracles of those, what? By the power, rather, of those miracles. Oh, you see, the world loves miracles. Oh, that's all they want to see. I'll never forget. Years ago, after leading a gentleman to the Lord, and he really got involved, and uh, he was uh, almost wishing that my ministry could grow. Well, I never dreamed I'd ever have more than my five nights a week of 35 to 50 people. Never dreamed it'd ever be more than that. But he drove up to my, my home one day, and he said, Les, he said, if you could just perform one miracle. He said, you wouldn't just have 50 people in your classes, you'd have 50,000. I said, I know that. I don't want 50,000 people coming to see a miracle. That's not where it's at. What I want to see is the Lord opening the hearts, as he did Lydia, one at a time if need be, two, 
and have those two go out and win two, have this one go out and win one, and hey, that'll accomplish far more than a miracle. The miracle of that is that's how the Spirit works. But you see, the population in general wants a miracle. They want to be entertained, see? All right, now look, they're going to get it. And so he deceives them by performing miracles, which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image. Oh, now you're already calling him God, but if you're really going to worship him someplace other than here in Jerusalem, we better make an image. Now, I don't know, the scripture doesn't say this, but I know that in every religion where they worship an image of a god, whether it's Apollos or Zeus or whoever, they didn't just have one huge image someplace, but what? Every home had a replica. And I personally think this is what's going to be. These images of this man, Antichrist, will be made available to the whole world so they can have him on their mantle. And they can worship him as their god, even as the pagans have done in the past. Now, that's my own idea. I'm telling you now, the scripture doesn't say that. But they're going to make an image like unto the man Antichrist so that people can worship him even as they've worshipped other pagan idols. All right. Now look at verse 15. If you don't think these guys are going to have satanic power, and he had power from Satan to give life unto the image, and that the image should speak and cause as many who would not worship the image of the beast, they should be killed. Now again, I'll put it in every living room. I think these images will be given satanic power that as these poor benighted souls speak to it and worship it, it's going to be able to respond. And oh, these people are going to think they've got the real God right there on the mantle in their living room. Isn't it scary? But it's coming. Just as sure as we're sitting here, it's coming. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.